Welcome to the second part of this brief history of international cooperation for INS 201 Model United Nations. Following on from looking at liberalism, we're going to examine other contributing factors to the growth of international organisation. Specifically, we'll look at the role of international law, the growth of the idea of universal human rights, the emergence of international social movements, and the growing faith in human capacity to organise as key contributors to this emergence. Next, we'll look at the League of Nations, its establishment, structure, strengths and weaknesses, and we'll ask whether it was an idealist organisation. The first in our list of other inspirations for international cooperation is international law. The development of a legalistic approach to international cooperation actually predates liberalism. Its origins go back to the Romans, in particular the Roman philosopher Marcus Tullius Cicero, who argued that war should be declared publicly and the only acceptable reasons for it were self-defence or retribution. The legal approach was greatly progressed by Christian theologians, in particular St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, who further debated just reasons for going to war and other issues. However, it was a Dutch jurist of the late 16th and early 17th centuries named Hugo Grotius who most effectively articulated just war frameworks and other legal issues and indeed he's regarded as the father of international law. Grotius in his On the Law of War and Peace distinguished between the reasons for war or just ad bellum and the conduct of war or just in bello. This distinction means it's possible to, for example, regard the cause for going to war, or a particular war, as just, while denouncing the conduct of that same war. So these were the early ideas contributing to the growth of law, but practices are equally vital. In this case, the first Hague Peace Conference in 1899 and the second in 1907 were early forays into law as a way of regulating the international sphere. The Hague Conference was focused on the issue of disarmament. It didn't make much progress in that area. However, it did set up a permanent court of arbitration as a way of settling disputes between nations. This was a fairly radical idea at the time, though it was contested by those who thought the politics should and would retain its central role in sorting international disputes. The court is still around today and has 115 members, but taking cases to it is voluntary and it dealt with very few cases until around 1990. Since then, the number of cases has increased, though details of the cases are only published if the parties agree, so its work remains a bit of a mystery. The same conference also established the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which were the first formal laws of war and war crimes in secular international law. They forbade the use of poison or poisonous weapons in warfare, but that, of course, didn't stop their use a few short years later in World War I. There's more on the role of international law in week two when you can listen to an interview with Professor David Friesden from George Washington University Law School. Philosophically, one of the great contributors to human rights discourse was another British liberal philosopher, John Locke. He famously said in his second treatise of government that men are, and I quote, by nature free, equal, independent, no one can be subjected to the political power of another without his own consent. The only way whereby anyone divests himself of this natural liberty and puts on the bonds of civil society is by agreeing with other men to join and unite into a community for their comfortable, safe and peaceable living. It was only with the first US War of Independence and the French Revolution that we saw the first systemization of liberal human rights by states. The 1776 U.S. De Declaration of Independence claimed that, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. The 1789 French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen made similar claims about human rights. A third impetus towards international cooperation and organisation was the development of international social movements. There are a whole range of movements that could be highlighted here. I've chosen two that fall within the liberal tradition, namely the anti-slavery movement and the Red Cross. The anti-slavery movement organised meetings, wrote pamphlets, took out ads in newspapers and pressured their political leaders. So with Great Britain in the lead, the great powers, through the Treaty of Paris in 1815, 
actually agreed to stop the slave trade. Trading in slaves wasn't outlawed until 1890 with the Brussels Convention and only in 1926 with the Slavery Convention was slavery itself outlawed. These are some early examples of international agreements between states and they happen thanks to groups of concerned citizens organising and pressuring their governments. In other words, thanks to social movements. An equally powerful example of this is the formation of the Red Cross. This occurred after a Swiss businessman named Henri Dunant was horrified by the lack of care for wounded soldiers that he witnessed during the Battle of Solferino in 1859. With the support of Gustave Monnier, a Genevan businessman, they established the organisation that became the International Red Cross in 1863. Dunant also proposed the establishment of a government treaty recognising the neutrality of the agencies treating the wounded and allowing them to provide aid in a war zone. This resulted in the first Geneva Convention in 1864 for the amelioration of the conditions of the wounded and sick in armed forces in the field. This was extended to include treatment of civilians and the conventions were extensively updated after World War II in 1949. Importantly, responsibility for enforcing the Geneva Conventions was handed to the United Nations Security Council. However, it has rarely invoked this authority, so where grievances have been investigated and resolved, it has tended to be done through regional treaties or national law. Enforceability remains a major challenge to international human rights regimes. What we see here too with all these conventions is the growing influence of what was at that time a very new profession, that is of course lawyers. A fourth influence on international cooperation was simply the new faith in human capacity to organise and manage that emerged with the Industrial Revolution. As Mark Mazower explained, we saw the emergence of the, and I quote, concept of the engineer as labourer for mankind, the technician as harmonizer of peoples, and with it came a quasi-evolutionary rationale for the principle of international organisation." This was supported by the idea that greater international organisation could decrease conflicts and wars and promote human wel welfare. This improved organisation was to be achieved through gradual reformism rather than radical change. Given the belief in the capacity to organise, mechanisms to facilitate it developed, and key amongst these was a strong in focus on international standardisation. This standardisation produced the world's first public international union, the International Telegraph Union in 1865, and the International Postal Union in 1874, which are all now part of the United Nations system. So, to quote Mazoya again, sometime between the 1770s and 1830s, it became possible, against the backdrop of the French Revolution and the concert of Europe, to imagine an alternative international politics, one that acknowledged the diversity of peoples, beliefs and forms of government, and showed their reconciliation under the banner of civilization. This was new. Moving further into the 19th century, we see a notable growth in the number of international governmental organisations, and of states too. Although the concert of Europe didn't survive, it was replaced in the 20th century with a more inclusive organisation, the League of Nations. The idea for a League of Nations emerged from the process and ideas that I've described above, but more specific proposals started emerging from peace organisations in the US and UK in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A British political scientist by the name of Goldsworthy Lowers Dickinson is given credit for coining the term League of Nations in 1914, which came out with his scheme for his, its organisation. The British, French, US and USSR also came to support the idea, though historians agree that US President Woodrow Wilson's support was a crucial factor in its establishment. The League was founded on the 10th of January 1920 from the Paris Peace Conference that ended the First World War. It was the first international organisation whose principal mission was to maintain world peace. This is the so-called Big Four at the Paris Peace Conference. David Lloyd George from Britain, Vittorio Orlando from Italy, Georges Clemenceau from France and Woodrow Wilson from the US. There's a link on the website to a BBC PBS documentary on called People's Century that explains more about this role and the history of the League.
The League was made up of a General Assembly representing all member states of which there were originally 42, an Executive Council, whose membership was limited to major powers, a permanent secretariat and a court of justice. The structure is really like that of a liberal democratic state. You can think of it as a legislature made up of two bodies. The General Assembly is like a lower house and the Executive Council is like a Senate, but both with no actual legislative capacity in this case. The Secretariat was a rather weak version of an executive, and the judiciary is an equivalent to the court system. Along with no legislative capacity, another thing missing compared to that of a state was enforcement capacity. There was no military or police. So although it's structured along the model of a world government, it wasn't a world government. The UN also drew on this model, so it has similar features and some similar weaknesses but even less approach as a world government than the League of Nations did as collective security was largely quashed. Some of the main weaknesses of the League were that the Executive Council required unanimous voting of its nine and later fifteen members so even small nations on the Council had an effective veto and there was no special status for the permanent members of the Council. Further the Council's powers were too broad for many states to be willing to act on anything. Representation was also an issue. There were 42 original members, with Germany and the USSR initially excluded. The USSR joined in 1934, but was expelled in 1939. And Germany joined in 1926, but both it and Japan left in 1933, followed by Italy in 1937. The US, despite being a key party in the League's establishment, didn't join as the Congress didn't ratify the League of Nations Covenant. With this limited membership, the League really became an instrument of Britain and France, which wasn't a good basis for an international organisation designed to promote peace. Another ultimate weakness was collective security. The idea promoted by Woodrow Wilson that the invasion of any country should automatically result in the combined efforts of all nations to combat aggression, and that in doing so, the collective good would be served. This idea is captured in a statement by the Haitian representative to the League after Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1935-36. He said, I quote, Great or small, strong or weak, near or far, white or coloured, let us never forget that one day we may be somebody's Ethiopia. Unquote. Even though collective security was championed by Wilson, it was a key reason that the US didn't end up joining the League. The traditional isolationist elements in the US opposed the League's articles requiring members to defend another member if it was attacked. This is the apogee of the idealist approaches to international relations, requiring nations to act possibly against states that they themselves considered friendly and in ways that could endanger their pursuit of their own national interest. All this potentially in support of states for which they had no affinity. This was too much for the isolationist factions in the US, and given their strong political influence, the US didn't join. Moreover, this approach was also too much for many of the other nations that joined, especially the big powers whose action was needed. The failure of the League with the outbreak of World War II led to quite a bit of discrediting of the idea of idealism in international relations. Reviewing the work of the League overall, there's a few key things to be noted. First, economic and social cooperation did develop and notable successes included in the area of aid to refugees and reducing the global trade in opium. There were also several collective security successes helped on by the public horror at the losses from the First World War. For example, a Swedish-Finnish dispute in 1920-21 over the Arland Islands was settled and a conflict between Greece and Bulgaria in 1925 was avoided. Second, national self-determination and minority rights, which were the principles of the League, were not principles that applied to the colonies or peoples of the victors of World War I. So, there wasn't an equal footing in the League. Third, the League had no response to the Great Depression of 1929, which saw unemployment skyrocket over the globe reaching over 25% in a range of countries. Fourth, despite those successes in collective security, for the most part that didn't function well. For example, when the Poles seized Vilnius from Lithuania in 1920, 
Further, it became clear that the League lacked power when it came to disputes involving large states. Extremism rose with declining economic conditions in the 1930s caused by the Great Depression, and the League couldn't deal with the aggression of major states. They didn't effectively condemn Italian and German expansionism. There were around 37 disputes between 1920 and 1937, and only 14 of those were referred to the League of Nations. And of those 14, only six were actually resolved by the League. A couple more positive legacies of the League were that technical cooperation did grow despite the failures in economic and political cooperation. So the International Labour Organization and the Health Organization, later the World Health Organization, were both established under the League. The League also rejected a legalistic approach in favour of political decision making about international issues and this continued with the United Nations system, although legal channels have grown as well. The end of the League came with the outbreak of World War II. Although in late 1939 the Assembly did transfer enough power to the Secretary General to allow the League to exist legally during the war, operations were dramatically reduced, the headquarters, the Palace of Nations, remained unoccupied, but 12 members of the Secretariat were moved to the US. The final meeting was the 12th of April 1946 in Geneva, and that meeting liquidated the organization, settling its debts, transferring assets to the United Nations, and returning funds to nations that had given them. Its final day was the 19th of April. To conclude, what we've seen over these two clips is that there are a range of beliefs and practices that have paved the way for a more expansive international cooperation, and liberalism was certainly a key influence. The League of Nations was often decried as not just liberal but idealist and this basis is often said to be the cause of its failure. Nevertheless it had some successes and provided much of the model for the United Nations. The next lecture will look at the UN's establishment and a little on its structure but first watch our animation of the United Nations structure. <laughs>